David Graeber's point was that the debt is older than money. So he said that these kind of debt arrangements where where farmers, for example, are taxed, that this is, I think, about 5,000 years old then. So mm -hmm. the idea yeah. is that if you are a farmer, you will be taxed. So you deliver your grain to the temple and they give you a stick, which they, they divide into two halves and they, they give you one stick. And when the tax collector comes, you, you hand over the stick. The tax collector checks whether it, it's a fit and then it kind of proves that you have paid your taxes. Um, and if you had a nice harvest, maybe you got three sticks, but you only need one to pay your taxes. So the extra two sticks you can use to buy stuff because all your neighbors will, will want to have those sticks as well because it proves that you have paid your taxes, right? So this is what um, what Georg Friedrich Knapp, a German economist from the 20th century and 19th century, um, he called that uh, charterlist uh, money. So so money is the thing or, or the, the legal thing uh, that you can use to make payments to the state. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. This is uh, an episode that I'm hoping will be the first interview in a larger series looking at David Graeber's work, Debt. And as a prequel, I'm looking at this work that Graeber wrote uh, after Debt uh, against economics. And I'm joined today by an MMT economist, Dirk Enns, to discuss this work against economics. And uh, I don't know if you're allowed to be against economics as an economist, but Dirk, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Graham. So I think you said you you hadn't had a chance to look at this piece before, um, but you have looked at it now. So I've got plenty of questions for you, but I thought if you've just got a first response to um, this article or Graeber's work in general, we could start there. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I can start, just start with a personal anecdote um, because I met David Graeber some years ago. Um, it was in Berlin and a friend of mine told me that Graeber would be in, in Berlin. So I, I met David Graeber then. And uh, he, he said that he would be doing some kind of uh, TV series for the BBC discussing economic things, uh, among them taxes and the role that taxes play in society and money creation. And of course, I was, I was very hopeful that he would talk about also MMT, modern monetary theory. And he said, yeah, yeah, he, he did look into it. Um, but sadly, he, he died, he passed away, and, and the thing was never realized. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when I read this article, it, it kind of reminded me that, that David was looking for, for different kind of answers, and economics provided answers, as he also wrote in his article, that, that maybe fitted to problems from half a century ago. Um, but I, I think he's correct, more or less, uh, in, in his article criticizing economics, that, that it is not keeping up with, with what is happening in the world. Okay, I mean, I, I, he might. I mean, I would be consider going even further that uh, perhaps at least since Keynes, you could argue that uh, economics has made very little sense. I mean, one of the things that Graeber argues in this article is that governments end up applying an economic theory that that works, that that uh, understands how money creation works, sort of by accident and desperation, which is to say they have a theory drawn from uh, the work of Milton Friedman, especially, and it, it, it doesn't work. And then sort of, you know, in desperation, because they don't know what else to do, they start r running a playbook that, that makes sense. At least that's Graeber's argument that this happens over and over again. So I wanted to see if you thought that seemed mostly right. Yeah, I think I do I think that it's mostly right. Um, it, it reminds me of The Simpsons when when the episode started. There's a there's a scene where Maggie the baby is steering a car, <laughs> and and you're wondering like, okay, is she really driving that car? And then the camera zooms out and you see Marge the mother steering the actual car, and the baby just had some kind of some toy uh, toy steering wheel, <laughs> uh, and and that's what it is. I mean, the central banks are supposed to steer the economy, but they can't. But they still are pretending that monetary policy is somehow able to steer the economy, and whenever really things go 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 badly, like the financial crisis or the pandemic, they always increase government spending to bail out the banks or to, to provide a lot of money to, to uh, develop some medicines. Um, so, so it's kind of an open secret that one thing is theory 
And the other one is what, what the governments do in terms of, of practical policy. So the theory is, and I, if I'm, I've got this right, you know, because I think I understand the concepts relatively well if I don't uh, get bogged down in, in what the economic orthodoxy is. I think I understand what's actually going on, but not the orthodoxy so well because it doesn't make sense. The theory is, and this is called monetarism, right, that the central bank, by uh, raising and lowering interest rates and also quantitative easing, which maybe we want to explain or, or maybe not, can modify the economy, can, uh, you know, kind of, as you say, steer what's going to happen. And in fact, at least since John Maynard Keynes, we've understood quite well that the government can steer the economy and it steers the economy by, you know, by by doing stuff with with money. Um, but for some reason, this is called fiscal policy, not monetary policy, even though they both involve the government intervening in the money supply, we have to put them in two separate categories, which always confuses me. And the, argu the argument is, the orthodox argument is, and then I'll turn it over to you, that it is good and right and true for the government to the this body that is kind of governmental and kind of not the central bank to do monetary policy and fiscal policy should be separate and maybe isn't that important to booms and busts is, is that roughly the the orthodox view yeah yeah that's roughly that is actually that's pretty pretty much here with the orthodox view um maybe we can unpack it a little um because when when monetarism started they they tried to to get rid of fiscal policy so the idea that the government would be spending lots of money um and in every recession of course you would increase government spending so if you if you move forward through the decades um it would mean that the, the government spending would always be bigger and bigger and bigger and um some people in the business sector especially were worried and they believed that it was not a good idea to give more and more money or have more and more government spending in the economy, even though this is a kind of law of economics. So the, um, the, the industrial sector, because it is getting more and more efficient, in relative terms will be always smaller, because the more efficient you are, uh, the less people, the less workers you will need. Okay, so, so also the US has deindustrialized uh, in, the, in the 2000s, it was not because of, of efficiency in, in that case, but because a lot of jobs were, were uh, brought uh, to, to another place, um, mostly China, but also to some extent Germany, I would think. Um, but yeah, going back to monetarism, so they, they had this idea that the government could, through the central bank, control the economy. So um, if you increase the monetary supply, then the banks would lend on that additional money, and then you would have, I don't know, a boom. Um, the problem is that we cannot have um, central bank money. So you and I, we don't have accounts at the Fed. Uh, and that means that if a bank would say, hey, I have some money at the Fed, do you want it? Uh, there's no way that you could technically get that money. Okay, so, so it didn't work. Uh, and also it didn't work because they wanted to target the money supply. So Milton Friedman and the monetarists in, in the 80s when Paul Volcker was, was trying to, to impose mo the monetarist policy regime, and and Volker said in the end, we didn't know what kind of monetary uh, aggregate to target. They all went uh, haywire. Uh, one went up, the other went down. And, and um, of course, interest rates, they, they went up for quite a lot because uh, they, they said, let's, let's slow down the economy. So if you, if you want to determine the quantity of, of central bank money in the economy, it means you lose control over the interest rate. You can only determine one. OK, so. Uh, either you determine the quantity or you determine the price. So, so they they switch to this approach that we still have, which is the interest rate. Okay. So now they say, in order to slow down inflation, we raise the interest rate. They don't say anymore we reduce the amount of money, as the monetarist old school said. So we are in what I would call monetarism 2.0. So this is what is called New Keynesian, even though it has nothing to do with Keynes, New Keynesian policy. Um, where you talk about, uh, I don't know, output gaps and, and inflation targets and all these kind of things, but it's just technical jargon. So in the end, you have still the old idea that central banks moving interest rates up and down steers the economy, but we can see also in the United States currently that it doesn't work. So interest rates have gone way up and employment in January now, the new numbers have been published last, last week. Employment is going up quite a lot right now, so it doesn't work. 
Yeah, I think this is a, a, a really important point to make, and it's one of Graeber's key points in this article. As, as an empirical science, um, what is called macroeconomics, this like big picture sense of how, you know, how the economy works and what governments can do, it has, uh, it seems like a 0% success rate, like in terms of if, if when its theories are tested, um, either in the real world, or if you go back and look at what happened in the past, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Also in the Eurozone, we had 10 years of zero interest rates almost from 2010 to 2019, just before the pandemic. And you would have thought with 10 years of zero interest rates, we would have a real, really big boom of private investment reaching historical heights, uh, but it didn't. Um, so before we discovered that that uh, that high interest rates do not stop inflation, we also discovered for 10 years that low interest rates <laughs> don't increase inflation. Okay, so the Eurozone or, or Germany, which is the biggest economy of the Eurozone, uh, entered the recession in the end of 2019. So even at zero interest rates, constant zero interest rates, still we, we went into a recession. So it was not, you cannot say that zero interest rates are expansionary somehow. Okay, that's, they still call it that, but it's, um, it, I mean, Graves is right. I mean, what is important is the empirical thing. And if something is not increasing economic growth, then you cannot call it expansionary. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So to 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 put this um to put this conventional view uh, again in a way that I think we can just clearly make sense of it. The argument is, if uh, if interest rates are lower, so the the central bank is charging less money to banks as they are moving money between one another and therefore also making money. And we'll get to the fact that banks banks make money in a second. Then there will be more there will be more money and the economy will grow and everyone will be happy and have lots of jobs and everything will be great. But then we will get eventually what is called a bubble, right? And then people will have too much money and they'll be taking out too much debt and we'll have a catastrophe. And so before that happens, it is the uh, central bank's job to raise interest rates, which hurts the economy and uh, makes people unemployed and people starve and die, but that's okay because whatever that's not the government's job it's the government's job to, to do a couple of things and employment is only one of them and then we yep. can just sort of coast on these like gentle ups and downs based on the interest rates as the governments are moving these interest rates ups and downs so our booms don't get too boomy and our busts aren't too bad and uh, we've been doing this at least since the 80s, and we've had terrible booms and terrible busts since then, and no, and no evidence that this is working. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, quite to the contrary. I mean, even um, even if there is a bubble, the central banks are normally hesitant to intervene. So, I mean, <laughs> real estate prices were sky high in 2007, also in 2006, both in the US and in the Eurozone. It was happening in Ireland. It was happening in Spain. But central banks were reluctant to to increase interest rates, so so they don't even follow their own recipe. Um, but instead, they are just guided by these theoretical models and uh, these new Keynesian models. Say they basically say, if you have price stability, you will automatically get full employment. So, mm -hmm. in technical terms, if there's no inflation gap, so if you have target inflation, then also there will not be any output gap, meaning that the potential output and the actual output are more or less the same. Um, and that's a, that's an assumption in the model. Um, but um, the the main idea is is, is weak, as you, as you just described. The idea that higher interest rates are supposed to slow down the economy is that if you have high interest rates, it's a cost to business, and then the business is, it just means that I can increase prices. Okay, so they just increase prices after an increase in the interest rate, and uh, that's that's why interest rate policy doesn't work because. If there's a lack of demand, then you cannot go to low interest rates, even at zero. If there's no demand for your product, why increase investment? So it's not going to happen. And at at a high level of aggregate demand, even higher interest rates will not stop you from investing. So it doesn't work up. It doesn't work going down. It's it's just not working at all. Okay. This this leads us to the next thing that Graver says is you know so economics has this problem. So he he identifies sort of these two crucial problems about the field of economics in this article. The first one is that mon monetarism doesn't work because they don't understand money and we'll, we, we will get to how money works. And the second one is that everything has to be self-regulating. Uh, no interventions are allowed because um, since everyone is a rational economic agent, um, 
you should not intervene in some sort of top-down way. And this means that the person who is supposed to be driving, uh, if you're Alan Greenspan, you shouldn't intervene either. And Graeber says this takes us to this point of new absurdity that the uh, it's the central, it's the chair of the Fed's job to intervene, but intervention is by definition a bad thing. So it's not even clear. I think this is where he quotes Skidelsky. It's not even clear why, according to one branch of economics, we would even have someone doing monetary policy. Let's just leave it alone and everything will be fine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really odd because the models kind of assume that all the uh, agents in the economy have the correct model of the economy in their head yeah. because they are rational. So so if everybody's rational, I mean, it's it's kind of assuming or those models are assuming that the, that the economic actors are more rational and know no, more about the economy than the central bankers. Let's talk then about how how money is created. When I read it against economics for the first time, the thing that struck me the most was this description of how banks create money, which um, I guess I had, like everyone else, roughly had the sense that the government is the one who creates money either by printing it or via keystrokes. And obviously, in a certain sense, this is true and governments can create money that way. But much, if not, I would guess most, you can maybe tell me the empirical data of the of the money that we use on a day-to-day -day basis is created by banks. Banks put uh, a number in one column and the same number in uh, a different column when they make a loan and you know there wasn't money before and then that money then exists. At least that's Graeber's description. So does that sound right to you? Yeah, that's, that's the description in his paper. Um, but I um, I would not be sure whether this, this is the case um, because I just recently looked at the monetary system of Sweden and in Sweden the government spends more than 50% of GDP mm. so government spending divided by GDP is yeah it's more than half and because the Swedish government pays by money creation it means that more money is created by by the Swedish government than than by any other economic actor. Um, and we also should not forget that the banks, they can create money or what I would call it's, it's a promise of payment really. It's not, not the actual money that they're creating. They're not allowed to do that. The monopoly with money creation is with the central banks. Um, but the banks can create promises of payment, which are bank deposits for us, but we have to repay those bank deposits. So the problem with money that is created, so I just loosely call it money now, so the, the problem with bank created money is that all of this money has to be repaid. So, so the banks cannot be net creators of money over the long term because all of these loans will have to be repaid eventually. Yeah, so this is this is a thing I think where um, Graeber's ideas diverge in a certain way from MMT, but in many ways they do not. We can get to we can get to MMT um, in a second. So. I mean, yeah, it seems to me that, of course, the, the banks can't create a net amount of money. In fact, they're creating, you know, zero money when they create money. On the other hand, this uh, money as the lubricant, it, do, it does work for banks to create money. Does that, I don't know if that description works, and we can get to the government sovereign uh, and monopolistic element over the creation of whatever you want to call it, re, real money uh, now 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 we're in a sticky place and i'm going to depend on you to get us out of it i guess yeah so i think what uh what you could say about the banks is that they finance a lot of investment in the private sector so when a company wants to do something like they want to invest in a let's say a new power plant um they will go to a bank and ask the bank whether they somehow will help financing it either through a loan or a bond uh, issuer or or uh, shares or whatever they they can think about um and in that, in that case, the banks have a lot of power, okay? So they determine which kind of projects do get financed and which kind of projects do not get financed. So, so that means that the banking system is very important for, for the economy, at least for the private sector, um, whereas the public investment is financed by the government creating its own money. So the banks um, and their money creation, that's, that's the way of the private sector to organize resources and to make sure that, organizers, that resources are organized well. And then on the other hand, you have the, the government sector with, with its money creation, which is somehow looking at the public purpose and trying to create stuff that we want, not necessarily for, for a profit. 
And these are the two main mechanisms that we have in, in our modern societies, which are at work uh, with, with their own money creation each. Yeah, so that, that sounds right. And to, to say that most of the money that's in circulation is created by the banks, um, and, and Graeber's saying this, I think, about the United Kingdom, is not to say that most of the money in circulation needs to be created by the bank. So it makes complete sense that um, uh, a country like Sweden with a larger public sector, you, you can easily imagine a country having 50, 60, 70 percent of the creation of uh, the money that people are spending. It's just that's a I guess that's a political question, a political question that impinges on economics. Yeah, I mean, it's in our democracies, it's it's at least uh, theoretically, it's up for us to decide. I mean, as as people who are voting, and then of course the the representatives in in the parliament um, or in in Congress, they are then drafting the budget and they determine what kind of money is spent on what kind of issues. So the Biden administration has has spent quite a lot of money, for example, and also has subsidized heavily some some things which uh, regards the the green transition, for example. Um, so yeah, it's it's in the end, it's it's part of um, of the political system to decide how much government spending will be coming forward and on what this kind of government money is spent. And of course, it is the government that that authorizes banks to make the money that counts as a as a U.S. dollar or a, a euro or a pound sterling. Um, so here's a question. In the 19th century, which is the field that I studied, um, I worked mostly on fiction, but fiction about uh, economic growth and progress. People who were always spending not, you know, what was called greenbacks, which is to say dollars made by the U.S. government, but they were spending what they called banknotes. The paper currency at the time was mostly made by banks rather than by the U.S. government, and also no one accepted it at face value. Sometimes even the bank itself did not accept the money it had created at face value. And I'm wondering if part of our confusion about the fact that banks create money, but also it's a slightly different kind of money, is a product of the 20th and the 21st century and the computer creation of money. And in the 19th century, a bank would would stamp $5 on a piece of paper um, and it would be signed by the head of the bank or the head of the branch of that bank, but then it, you couldn't actually exchange it for five greenbacks at a, any other bank except for that bank. Um, and I wonder if you know anything about the history of the transition from banknotes to the computer system, because I myself don't know anything about that transition. Um, okay. Um, let me, okay, these thoughts will be a bit chaotic because I'm not an expert in the field, but I can, I, I know about some of the, the, the dots and, and maybe we can connect them, starting okay. with David Graeber's book, 5,000 Years of Debt. So, I mean, uh, David Graeber's point was that the debt is older than money. So he said that these kind of debt arrangements where where farmers, for example, are taxed, that this is, I think, about 5,000 years old then. So mm -hmm. the idea yeah. is that if you are a farmer, you will be taxed. So you deliver your grain to the temple and they give you a stick, which they, they divide into two halves and they, they give you one stick. And when the tax collector comes, you, you hand over the stick. The tax collector checks whether it, it's a fit and then it kind of proves that you have paid your taxes. Um, and if you had a nice harvest, maybe you got three sticks, but you only need one to pay your taxes. So the extra two sticks you can use to buy stuff because all your neighbors will, will want to have those sticks as well because it proves that you have paid your taxes, right? So this is what um, what Georg Friedrich Knapp, a German economist from the 20th century and 19th century, um, he called that uh, charterlist uh, money. So so money is the thing or, or the the legal thing uh, that you can use to make payments to the state. And that's that's very old. And then we have money that you can weigh, for example, gold coins by weight um, or silver coins by weight. And that's what uh, was also in use in the United States. There were these big debates in the 19th century about whether having a gold standard or having a silver standard or both, or whether you have land banks which are willing to give loans against collateral, which is land. So the farmers needed that to get their... their um, the planting materials. Um, so 
there was a lot of debate in the 19th century about, about the monetary system, while today there's almost no debate at all about the monetary system, not even after the global financial crisis. Okay, so nothing really happened when it comes to banking regulation. So how did we end up moving then from, from some kind of yeah, paper currency to, to the digital age? Well, I think a crucial moment was the creation of the Federal Reserve uh, Bank, um, and that's because of the panning of 1907. Um, there was a banking panic, so people tried to convert their banknotes, and I think it was mostly a promise to pay out gold. Um, and the people were afraid that, that the bank would not have enough gold. Um, and in the end, JP Morgan, the banker, had to uh, lend out his gold to the other banks to stop the bank run. Yeah. It was kind of nice that he did it, <laughs> at least for the other banks. Um, but the bankers realized that they cannot depend on, on a single banker uh, for the functioning of their whole banking system. So they said, we need something else to, to swap these banknotes for. And the idea was to swap them not for gold, but to swap them for government cash. Okay, so this is when, yeah, when the United States um, started the Federal Reserve Bank. And I think they, they moved it forward somewhat because the First World War started in 1914. Uh, and I think that's roughly when the Fed was created. Um, so they said, okay, we, we now, we are, I think they were still on the gold standard, but at some point they said, look, okay, we, we will not be able to, to be on the gold standard anymore, but instead we will just deliver dollars and you can, you can use those dollars to make payments to the state. And, um, and that was okay. So people had no other way of, of doing things anyway. And you couldn't ship gold around, for example, for international transactions because of the U-boat war of the Germans. So, um, so the um, insurance um, rates for shipping gold and silver around were sky high. So the, the whole gold standard broke down um, and it kept, became impractical. And I think that was more or less the, the, one of the main moments in the 20th century in terms of, of monetary history when you went from some kind of banking-centered monetary system to a to a state-centered monetary system, but um, but you are right. This um, it's complicated, and I, I don't think there's there's any good book about it. For example, that that I would know of. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you, I couldn't find a book about it when I was writing my dissertation. That was ten years ago. I, I just mm -hmm. had to sort of put it together as best as as I could. So, the what's happening is. Banks are banks are making up money. I mean, the United States, that's the context I know in. They're they're making it up and it theoretically uh it's it's gonna be drawn on silver or then in the later 19th century in the gold standard, it's gonna be drawn on gold. You can take it to a certain amount of bank. Yeah, sorry. You can take mm -hmm. it to a bank and receive a certain amount of gold. And when a crisis comes along, it turns out this is not true. There isn't enough. There isn't enough gold. More money has been created uh, by these banks than there is, you know, theoretical money backing it, except for maybe in the hands of J.P. Morgan. So he solves he solves that, and then we are uh, brought to this point where we need to acknowledge that there has to be something behind this money that is. Uh, that is different from gold. And ultimately, and this, this skips, I guess, 100 years of history, what's behind it is the sovereign, the, the government. And if you go to Graeber, in fact, that's what was behind it 5,000 years ago as well. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's also, I mean, you have all these examples from the uh, colonial history. I mean, if you look at the monetary system of Virginia around 1760, you will also see that there was this kind of colonial paper currency. And when they wanted to build a bridge, they just issued uh, a, a proper amount of money, which was the Virginia pound. And they they uh, asked people to pay taxes in Virginia pounds. So this is why, why people would accept this kind of money and deliver, um, I don't know, foodstuffs or material to build a bridge or, or work even for the government directly. And, and that's how they did it. And then the British came and said, well, you can't do that anymore because we have to finance our wars and now you have to pay us in British pounds. Uh, so you, you, um, you have this kind of austerity policy imposed on the US colonies by, by the British. Um, and of course, the, the economies of, of America, they were not geared towards exports to, to the United Kingdom. So they, had, uh, they didn't want to do that and they, they did not get a lot of money for their exports. And this is what, what led to the American Revolution and, and independence and all of that. So 
so these kind of discussions about what money is and what you should do with the monetary system, um, it's, it's always uh, a very important part of our national histories, especially in the case of the United States, I would think. Yes, and running through, I mean, you can't even talk about the British currency. I mean, you can say a, a pound and, you know, another version of the pound, the gold version, which is, you know, has been at various times the guinea. It's also been called the sovereign. You've got these two things, the, the metal or the physical weight of the metal and then the power of the state intertwined. And Graeber's biggest argument, I think, in debt is that when you pull them apart, uh, which the sovereign doesn't want you to do very often, maybe up until the late 20th century, it's the power of the sovereign and debt and ultimately the coercion of the state that is really there. And the, the, the thing itself, the pound, the gold, the silver is just one more tool. It's, it's no different from that, that stick from the Sumerian temple. But we've uh, we've gotten it confused in our head, and we think that gold is yep. is is valuable um, in some way in in and of itself because we are not chartalists, if I've got that term right. Or, or, or chartalism yeah. is very hard for us to wrap our head around, even though Graeber has shown that's been what money has been for as long as there's been debt since before there was money. Yeah, yeah, but it's you are right. I mean, we had this roughly a, a golden century, I would say, from roughly 1870 to 1970 or 71, um, when, when the US left the gold standard and, and said, okay, we will not convert any more dollars to gold. So, so for, for 100 years, people believed that somehow there was this intrinsic value of, of gold somewhere in the background of money creation. And as you said, I mean, central banks created money and there was promise to convert money into gold, except in every single crisis that said, oh, it's just, it was only a promise. And actually, <laughs> we're not going to do that anymore because we now have a crisis. You see, we have problems to solve. And this thing, it goes out of the window uh, as, as the first thing that goes out of the window. Um, so it's, I think it's been confusing also for, for a lot of economists um, who who went down the, the wrong road and who always thought about public finance, for example, in terms of gold coins. So they thought about governments uh, first having to tax or sell government bonds in order to get gold coins, and then they would spend those gold coins. <laughs> um, but that's that's not how the paper currency world worked, uh, not even in Virginia in 1760, and of course not, not today. Yeah, and so then what happens in, in 2008, I think this can take us to the present, and then we can get into you know the heart of, of MMT, which you can explain to the listeners. What happens in 2008 is kind of a version of what happens in in 1907. There's there's a run on the banks. People ask for you know the the money they have gotten. They want to redeem the money they have gotten from the bank. The bank created money from you know government backed money in the way that they might once have wanted gold but it's essentially the same thing there's no difference between the amount of gold that a government has designated to be worthwhile to pay off debts to the government or amount of uh dollars that a government has designated the important thing is the government designation and so when the crisis happens the government, um, I mean, they do a number of things and they do liquidize some uh, banks and, you know, there's markdowns, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, the government just makes up new money and gives it to the banks. And it makes up this money out of yep. thin air. The banks made up money out of thin air. But then when they were called on that, they had to admit that it was ultimately thin air. When the government makes up money out of thin air, everything is is fine because that's what yeah. sovereign governments do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, eco I mean, we, because we're talking about economists, so so the economists um, are to blame because first of all, they did not see the crisis coming, and and second, they are to blame because they 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 didn't even think that money was important in any way. So if you look in, at macroeconomic models, for example, up until this day, the new Keynesian models, for example, they do not include the state. Yeah. Okay, so there's there's no government sector. So it's absolutely of no consequence in a normal new Keynesian model, which they are still using to, to for their monetary policies. Um, there's, there's no consequences of the government increasing spending by, I don't know, 10% of GDP. 
or reducing government spending by 10% of GDP. I mean, and that's that's ridiculous. It's outright ridiculous. So, so of course, it's very important also to to model the banking system. So, if if you create a lot of bank loans and they are not repaid, um, and then you have house prices collapse, and then then people because they're unemployed are not able to to pay their mortgages, and then they are, get kicked out. Um, this kind of stuff was was not in the models. Um, financial markets were supposed to be efficient. And I remember that in 2003, I think it was the, the presidential address of the American Economic Association. Um, I don't remember who it was, but it was the, the president of the American Economic Association. So he said that, um, I would, yeah, it was Robert Lucas, Bob Lucas. He said that for practical purposes, uh, the problem of depressions, economic depressions, <laughs> is solved for the next couple of decades. He said that in 2003. Well, this uh, is just four Maggie years. driving the car again. Yeah, jerk. This is you know he's confidently at the wheel, but the wheel's not attached to anything. Yeah, exactly. And then you have Alan Greenspan, who said I think in two thousand five um, that with um, the new kind of risk sharing models that we are using in the financial sector, that the financial markets are more resilient than ever. Um, <laughs> kind of adding a sentence like, "What can possibly go wrong?" <laughs> and well, two years later, you had the subprime crisis, and this, and the whole whole thing came down. And also Ben Bernanke said like a year before that happened that inflation was now moderate and economic growth was was nice and also um, permanent and uh, also something something like a mission accomplished uh, um, yeah. speech that he held. And you could see all these economists saying that things were looking saying that things were looking good and they would be looking good for an, the next couple of decades. And they said that just before, like three or four years before the whole thing came down. And that, of course, should have led to a lot of soul searching. Um, and David Graeber was right to point out, even as late as December 2019, to point out that economics has a problem because they, they never properly reacted to the crisis and, and reinvented their, their ideas. Um, and I think now it's, it, starts, it has started now, um, but it's, it's, um, it has started at the fringe, if you want. So, so now in the periphery, you have new programs like um, economics of sustainability uh, and other programs, but it's it's not happening from inside the discipline. Um, so they are still happy with the old series. Well, as near as I can tell, you know, uh, M MMT uh, has you know has the same relationship to economics as like unionism does to the field of psychology for a you know whatever you want to say i would say orthodox but you could say mainstream practitioner it is just uh, a, a bunch of ridiculous um stories and is is not really attached to anything which for me is proof that of the of the failure of the field of economics but this gets you this difficult social problem if people's base view is that a certain view is insane and not to be taken seriously, it becomes very hard to get them to take this view seriously. Um, yes, I think Stephanie Kelton, um, the famous MMT economist, she said a couple of days ago that the bigger your battle is, the, the more, uh, the, the, the nicer will be the reward for, for winning the fight in the end. Mm. So, so <laughs> yes, I mean, the, we, we could have had a smooth transition in economics with um, the, the mainstream kind of saying, okay, um, let's discuss these kind of issues. Um, let's let's look into what Hyman Minsky said. Let's look into what MMT says, and then we create some kind of, of new synthesis. Um, that has happened uh, a lot of times already in, in economics. Also, the neoclassical synthesis was supposed to be a marriage between uh, neoclassical economics and Keynesian economics. I, I think it was not a good idea, but anyway, that happened. And you could have done the same in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Um, and, and it didn't happen. But now it's, of course, what you can see now is you have one economics, which is for theory and universities, which I think is more or less wrong. <laughs> so talking about money creation in banks, uh, where they say that banks are intermediaries lending out the savings and the reserves from the central banks to the households and firms, which is technically impossible. Um, you have people like Paul Krugman who says that, that the government deficit is financed by savings from the households, which is also completely wrong. And the, the uh, Central Bank of New Zealand just published a paper where they say explicitly that, that when the government of New Zealand spends, it creates more money. Whereas in, in Paul Krugman's story, it's a redistribution of money. 
So there's no no increase in the monetary aggregate in the amount of, of reserves, for instance. Um, so and, and then you have the world of the policymakers. So so when the pandemic hits, so what is Biden doing? Well, fiscal policy, increasing government spending. So a trillion here, a trillion there. And even the Wall Street Journal titled in 2020, uh, I think it was called the the article was called the trillion there, a trillion here, a trillion there. Why we are all modern monetary theorists now? <laughs> okay, so so all the almost all of the practitioners have at least realized um, that there's unlimited amounts of money available for a government if it wants to. They know they know that much, but but with this insight, you you could not go to a university and 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 lecture students because your colleagues would look at you in a funny way and and say, what kind of economist are you? And that's that's really odd because because the empirical evidence is is just staring you in the eye. Yeah, so I I, I want to give you uh, some time to just spend a little bit more explaining this the way MMT works. But I would say maybe this can get us started. We had a crisis in two thousand eight, um, which was a totally made up crisis. The banks created this crisis with their you know bad economics, and this was solved by the the U.S. government making lots of money. And the U.S. government gave it to the banks, which stabilized the system and also um, made people poor and and miserable. So it both demonstrated yeah. that the government can make up as much money as it wants. And it also demonstrated that if the government gives that money to banks, bad things happen. In yeah. three the last three years, we had a, a real crisis. The reason why the financial system was in dire straits is because factories were shut down and people were unable to do their jobs. The government did the same thing. It made money. It made a lot more money. Uh, there's a hawk howling outside of my window. I don't know if uh, the microphone is picking it up. So it made a great deal more money mm -hmm. and it gave it to people for the most part and various other places where it was needed. And it proved again what we already knew. The government can make up as much money as it wants. And it proved that where that money goes is the crucial thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I would agree that it was a big mistake, a policy mistake in 2008, 2009 to bail out the banks and not the people. So instead of giving the money to the banks, the, the US government could have spent that money on the real economy, um, buying stuff from, from workers and buying stuff from firms creating more jobs. And then of course the people would have had higher incomes and they would have been able to, to make their mortgage payments. So they would not have been kicked out. So I think under the Obama administrations, I think, I think was it 6 million households or 6 million people were kicked out of their flats yeah. and it was completely unnecessary. And it was, it would not, it would not be the advice of a truly Keynesian economics professor to do that. So too big to fail was an invention um, as, as, as it happened, so they just improvised. There is no such thing as too big to fail. So if a bank goes bankrupt, and then they can, are not allowed to create any more money, uh, which they still technically could do. Well, normally what you do is you you nationalize a bank, and then you you look at the assets, you look at the liabilities, and then you wonder whether there's a business plan which will work. So if you think the business plan is working, then you you sell off the bank after after the crisis is done. You sell it off to the private sector. And if you think that there's no business plan, um, you just uh, auction off all the assets and then you pay out whatever whatever you receive to to the people who, who own the bank. Um, so so that would be the the typical approach of pro, let's say progressive economists to to these kind of banking crisis. Um, and yeah, that was that was a moment that that showed also the power of the financial sector to. Well, to to influence a public debate because the public debate was was only in in their terms, and mm -hmm. um, it should have been also in our terms. Um, di discussing, yeah, discussing who gets what kind of uh, money and uh, where could the money otherwise go. Um, as Warren Mosler, who's one of the masterminds of MMT, once said, um, "There's there's no financial crisis that is so big that you cannot cure it by increasing government spending," um, and that's that's still correct. And that would be the the normal way uh, to to save the capitalist part of the economy from a crisis that you just increase government spending, and and that means also that you transition from the old economy into into a better into a new economy, because the government normally spends on things that are good for the public purpose, um, which normally brings us <laughs> moves us forward. I mean, this is this is where I think 
Dirk, I I disagree with the average uh, with the average MMT practitioner, and I feel like 2008 showed that yeah, the go the government can spend on lots of things, Dirk, and one of them is simply spending on making sure that bankers uh, have everything that bankers want. I'm I'm all for government yeah. spending on the programs I want, but when I hear people say, you know, well, the government, the public sector is good, the public sector makes you you know, nuclear weapons and the public sector bails out uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And I don't, I don't like it when the public sector does, does those things. But if we're actually a democracy, then I have a chance to influence that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, that's why I said that pro as a progressive economist, I would have had the idea that you would have spent the money in a different kind of way. But of course, the, the government does what it, what, is, what it does. And it, I mean, if you have a lot of inequality, uh, and I, I know that uh, financial sector firms in the US spend uh, hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars a year for lobbying. Um, so of course, that means that, that you get a problem in the democratic institutions that, that only the rich are hurt, and then the 99% are left out, which is, of course, what the, um, the, the Wall Street activists um, were all about, uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, so yeah, these are political problems, um, and they all have they have everything to do with with the question of money distribution and power. Yeah, it, yeah. And the the old economic story says, you know, oh, there's just the government. There's not much the government can do. The government can't make money. The government needs the private sector. Money is a scarce resource. This is this is completely wrong. MMT has told us that this is wrong, and MMT is empirically true. The second part of that, um, oh, the government should use the money that it can create to give people jobs, or I'm fairly anti-job, so I prefer something more like UBI, or to make sure people can pay their mortgages as opposed to giving money to bankers. That becomes a political question. But the reason why MMT is perceived as so left wing is because the economists have been telling us for at least 100 years that we can't have things like a healthcare system that works or like a robust education system for everyone because money is a scarce resource. If you know money can be created by the government, it seems obvious that our political conversation will be very different. So you can use you can use modern monetary theory to bail out the banks and let people starve. It's just uh, I think the belief is once people see that there's you know no real money behind the curtain, they will stop accepting the argument that we simply have to let people starve and we can't have good education and good lives because we've been told that it's because of money that we can't have those things and this is simply not true yeah but i would think that um this goes only this only goes back 40 or 50 years okay so after the in the post-world war ii period uh, the welfare states were created I think the, I would not count the US as a welfare state, to be honest. I think it's just the institutions are too weak and compared to the European welfare states, um, if, you are, if you don't have a job in America, you don't have health insurance and you, mm -hmm. you will be miserable um, and dependent on, on maybe rich people to give you, give you some money. But, but on the Western European welfare states, we, we had Christian the democratic governments who were building up the welfare state with public pension systems, with the National Health Service, also in the United Kingdom, although that was built up by labor, if I'm not mistaken. But in many other Western European countries, you also had conservative parties uh, helping to build that, that, that welfare state. And uh, nobody ever asked the question, so, so where does the money come from? Um, so that, 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 was not, that was not a debate um, mm -hmm. after the end of the Second World War, but when we were kind of rebuilding in Europe. Um, with the help also of American money and help of, of American machines and, and uh, other aid. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think that that is really the, the neoliberalism it's kind of- It's the 70s of, neoliberalism thing again. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that they, they changed the, they changed the, the, the money story. And then with, with Thatcher <laughs> and, and Reagan, so Thatcher said that there is no such thing as public money, there's only taxpayers' money. That was when it really started that um, this was pure ideology and not rooted in science at all. But most economists uh, at least did not doubt this kind of idea um, that there's no, there's no public money. 
I think you're quoting Paul Paul Krugman, who is both a Nobel Prize winner and a well-known member of the, you know, let's say the left side of the the aisle. He's certainly not considered a right winger in American terms. The fact yep. that he's telling the same story about money as Thatcher did tells you exactly exactly where the field of economics has taken us over the past five decades, and that is the that is the battle that we are fighting right now. Yeah, and I have to admit that I was a, a big uh, fan of, of Paul Krugman. <laughs> so <laughs> so he was one of the reasons that I, I got into economics and, and pursued my PhD because I, I did my PhD on economic geography, um, new economic geography to be precise, which is, uh, it has been restarted in, in a 1991 core periphery paper by Paul Krugman. So, so I liked his economics and only later I found out that his monetary ideas uh, are not are not correct. Um, so um, yeah, that's um, that's maybe so. So maybe in the end, Paul Krugman, at least for me, was a good thing. <laughs> so um, he got me into into the whole thing. Um, but yeah, now I I would agree that it's kind of odd that you have somehow pro supposedly progressive economists who are using theories that are building on on things that Margaret Thatcher said. Because if you look at academic papers, there is no, there's not a, not a single paper which which lays it out for you how governments can can finance government spending with tax payments um, in in a world where we have digital currencies. It does not exist. So it's just her word against anyone else's, and she's not even an economist. Um, so it's it's extremely odd that that economics has taken over this idea of tax the taxpayers' uh, money. Um, and I think it was a huge mistake for the whole discipline to do that. And it, it will, it will, oh, I probably we will have a divide. So I, I think that it's very likely that economics will split into two parts. One, which is moving forward to address the problems of the 21st century, uh, whether you call it then the master of economics of sustainability or um, something which is like a, a master of public purpose and innovation. Um, you will get these kind of programs and, and the people will know, the students will know what kind of things that they will they'll get there. So um, if you go to the economics faculty, you will be able to work maybe in a central bank or a treasury. Um, but if you want to solve the problems of the 21st century, you'll, you'll get into other programs. So I think there will be, and already there is some kind of divide now in economics. Um, and and I, I think that the economics departments will be will be the losers, just as David Graeber in his article at the very end kind of kind of things. Um, that this might be happening. Yeah. yeah, that sounds right. Okay, Dirk. I, I mean, look, I could, we could go through some interesting and key things about MMT and what it tells us about what's going on for another hour. Um, but uh, I, I think we we've covered more than what I was hoping we would cover. So all that's left is, uh, is there anything that you would like to add to our conversation before we wrap up? Well. Um... Yeah, if you ask me like this, I would think um, that it's very important um, that people believe different things about reality. And um, we're all trying to understand it, and we all know that we're not perfect. So, so we're just human trying to make sense of this whole complex world, which we don't understand. Uh, we don't even understand other people, not even the ones that we love sometimes. Um, so it's very complicated. And I would always um, be very happy if, if you if you engage with others to discuss economic things, to discuss the creation of money in good faith, I think there's a lot of bad faith out there, and probably Twitter and, and other social media platforms have helped to, to make these conversations turn, turn more and more toxic. Um, but it's very important for, for us as a society to listen to each other and, and to try to learn from each other, which is a social process. It's, it's very complex. And um, I always say that in the, in the years since the global financial crisis, I have learned much more about sociology than I ever wanted to learn. Okay, so, so yeah, that's, that's what would be like my, my methods to, to end this, um, that, that we should always be, be listening to, to the others and, and try to exchange arguments and, and um, look at the, the real world, because the real world is, is what matters in the end. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dirk. This has been a really uh, scintillating and eye-opening conversation. Thanks, Graham, again for, for having me. It was a pleasure.